Welcome to the Due Diligence Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and for more than 10 years with SNN, I've been doing interviews with microcap management teams at investor conferences globally, as well as online. Our SNN Live CEO video interviews are meant to pique interest, and then one can discover more by going to that company website. But personally, I always have more questions I want to ask. On this show, I'll be chatting with public company executives from microcap companies, and we'll dive deeper into companies that are rarely profiled. Microcap traditionally is overlooked, unloved, and absolutely never featured on legacy financial media outlets unless something material is going on. That's a good story. With my experience interviewing management teams, having interviewed most of them before, I've built up a network of companies, so there will be no shortage of content. Furthermore, this is an opportunity for me to showcase some of the qualitative lessons I've learned from guests on the Planet Microcap podcast. You can expect high-quality interviews with management teams that may have exposure to broader macro trends that you may never have thought of. One of the many reasons why I love the microcap space. So if you love microcaps and especially love learning about companies before the professionals do, let's start our due diligence. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast. My guest on the show today is Rick Van Kirk, CEO of Prodex Inc. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is PDEX on NASDAQ. Prodex Inc. specializes in the design, development, and manufacture of auto-clavable, battery-powered, and electric multifunction surgical drivers and shavers used primarily in the orthopedic, thoracic, and maxocranial facial markets. The company has patented adoptive torque limiting software and proprietary sealing solutions, and it also provides engineering quality and regulatory consulting services, and manufactures and sells rotary air motors in various industries. Prodex's products are found in hospitals and medical engineering labs around the world. I asked Rick to join me today to discuss why folks overcomplicate Prodex describing the company's IP and why that's important to understanding Prodex and their target customer base. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Rick Van Kirk, CEO of Prodex, Inc. Welcome to the Due Diligence Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And joining me today is Rick Van Kirk. He's the CEO of Prodex, Inc. It's a publicly traded company. The symbol is PDEX on NASDAQ. Rick, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Uh, Good. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's great to have you on. Now, we've connected before. Uh, Prodex has presented at one of our uh, investor events. It must be, well, it's at least three years. It might now be four or five. Uh, and, And for those who may not be familiar with the Prodex story or seen you present or heard you on, on an interview or something like that out there, what would you say is that one line that best describes Prodex? We design and manufacture medical devices. Very good. All right. You know, it's tough sometimes for, for folks to answer that question. You know, like that might be the hardest question that everybody that people might get like, Oh my gosh, how do I, how do I, especially with what folks are about to hear with Prodex, you know, It sounds simple, but there's a lot of complexity to what the company does. But before we get into all that, can you provide an overview and and history of the company? Yeah, the company has been around about 40 years. It started out in in a gentleman's garage. He made little air motors and that kind of morphed into making dental hand pieces. Um, Then about 25 years ago, uh, the conversion began to more of a medical device company. And the the business proposition was, hey, big company, we can design and develop your product in half the time you you can with all your red tape. And you can get your product into the market, you know, twice as fast. We just asked for the manufacturing rights in return. And so that kind of saved products and, and was a good model for some of our customers to follow. And we've been in that medical device 
arena for, like I said, about 25 years or so now. Got it. So you touched on, you know, this, I don't want to say the original problem because the company has clearly gone through a couple of different machinations to get to where it's at today. But, yeah. you know, when it did to make that shift to medical device, you know, what was that original problem that your potential customer base was facing and how did Prodex solve it? Well, their, their problem was trying to decide, you know, make or buy. Do we make this ourselves, design ourselves, or get it from the outside? And a lot of them had very busy engineering departments that would take three, four, five years, and who knows how much it would cost them to design a product. We would sign up to do it in a year and a half. And we were smaller, nimbler, not a lot of red tape, not a lot of layers, could make decisions faster. And so uh, because of that, we were able to charge a pretty good, you know, non-recurring engineering charge, if you will, and then secure those manufacturing rights to, to kind of carry on for a few years. So it helped them and it helped us. Was there, was, is there any one aspect of medical devices that the company tends to be specifically focused on? Or is it kind of, all right, any problem you all have, you know, we can, we can help? Uh, yes, and a little. Uh, primarily, we make power tools for the operating room, arthroscopic shavers, cranial screwdrivers, thoracic screwdrivers, and, and, and things like that. That said, we have a lot of manufacturing capabilities, and we're open to doing different things. We like to meet with and, and, and talk about potential projects with, with surgeons and universities who have ideas that maybe the, the bigger guys don't want to spend the time on, but we do. And it's a chance to kind of grow the business, A, and, and, and B, develop or bring in some new capabilities for us. Got it. All right. Well, we're going to dig into the business a little bit, uh, a little bit later, but you know, I, I also want to get your background as well, because that's, that's crucial to our conversation today. Um, you joined Prodex in January, 2006, uh, eventually being appointed CEO in January, 2015. You know, what originally attracted you to Prodex and how is that original thesis uh, for joining change or evolve over time? Okay, yeah. So the, the company I worked at before, I was the production manager and they outsourced production. So it was a little bit awkward there. And uh, they were nice. They liked me. So they created a project manager role for me, which was fine. But I liked manufacturing. So I actually saw an ad on Monster for a director of manufacturing at a company called Prodex and sent my resume in and, and, and came in and interviewed a couple of times and liked what I saw. It was, it was uh, kind of a small, almost had a mom and pop feel to us as a, a chance to really help develop and grow a, a, an operation A and B. I kind of sensed that there was a, a opportunity to kind of develop and, and grow into more of a senior role here. So I went for it. And in, in terms of the thesis, I guess, based on the fact we're talking today, that that part of the thesis came true about getting a more senior role. So. Very good. I mean, was I mean, how has just your own personal thesis when you were, you were originally looking at Prodex, how has that changed, you know, or ha has it changed along with, you know, basically the trajectory of the company as well? Um, it's, it's changed for me and in, in, in maybe seeing the broader picture, right? I was a little more focused on the shops and the planning operations. Now, obviously, every aspect, aspect of the business, you know, I've got to get involved with and, and understand. So, you know, I was, I was hoping to do that. I was kind of planning to do that and, and was able to have that opportunity over the last, you know, 15, 16 years to, to go through all that. Very good. All right. So now we're going to dig into the business itself. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the company is a contract manufacturer for the medical device industry. You know, can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the business model around that? Because traditionally CROs is, you know, low margin, you know, a, a real a tough, tough business, you know. So how, how is Prodex doing things a little bit differently? That's a really good question because traditionally we have been a contract manufacturer, but we're, I don't want to say we're changing, but we're adding on a technology part of the company. We, in addition to doing the contract manufacturing model I described earlier, we're now developing our own products and we have some proprietary technology that help us uh, compete out in the marketplace with some of these products that we do. So we've got both things going on. Um, you know, one of the things that's changed in our contract manufacturing model early on, we, like I said, we, we would propose, say, we'll develop this product for you in, in half the time but we require the manufacturing rights too. So some companies only need help with engineering and some companies only need help with manufacturing. So we've opened the aperture and say, basically, we'll help you with whatever you need. 
And, and that includes also engineering services kind of as a consulting basis or, or quality assurance services and helping with filings and things like that. So we've learned that to really serve the customers properly, we need to be open to help them with what they need, not what we think they need, if, if that makes sense. So that part of the CM business has developed. And as the company became successful over the years, again, we were able to invest into our own products and technologies that frankly helps shorten the sales cycle. Instead of convincing someone to go through a development process for a year and a half, two years, if we have something on the shelf and, and say, hey, we can put your name on this in two months and sell it to you, it, it's better for everybody else and, and the customer. So we're, we're trying to work both, both parts of the business. Got it. And by the way, I, for those who are listening in that were like, Bob, you said CRO. Yes, I know I said CRO. And I so I apologize for saying that it's the contract manufacturer. I my, my sometimes my, I interview a lot of biotechs as well. Right. And so yeah. the brain, the brain goes, uh, <laughs> the nah, we're all good. Goes yeah. CRO. but um, so go, going, let, let's dig down this rabbit hole a little bit. So what, who, who's the, and you alluded to this a little bit in the opening, but who is the, the main customer base that you're looking to attract to, to bring on board? It, primarily the, the large medical device distributors. Um, and, and we're fortunate we have some pretty good relationships. And, and the way we try to grow the business primarily is we try to leverage those relationships. The neat thing about if we make a cranial screwdriver for, for company A and they like it and they like that prior technology, They'll introduce us to the people down the hall in the thoracic group and say, hey, Prodex has this technology. They might be able to make a pretty cool screwdriver for you guys, too. And then if that goes well, they might introduce us to the people at the extremities department further down the hall or in the next building over. So we're fortunate that um, think about our top three customers. Uh, for one of them, we're on our third project now, and the other two, we've, we've completed two. So you know, we've done a good job and, and been invited back to do more. So we try to leverage the, the customer base that way. Uh, in addition to, um, it's kind of a me too industry. So if one of those customers has a product at a show, even though it's got their name on it and the small print, it'll say in the, in the back of the thing, hey, manufactured by product. So people wander over our booth and say, hey, we want one like those guys have over there. And then of course we do our own kind of, um, sales and marketing and try to track down people and get their attention and, and uh, convince them that um, you would really like this, this screwdriver that we do here, this technology, or we've got this capability and we've been making arthroscopic shavers for 25 years. If you need one, we're the people to do it for you. And, and we're getting some traction that way too. So. Got it. I mean, is, is that really the main value prop is the, listen, the company, this isn't a, one of those businesses that you you know I, I could just go down the street, uh, open up uh, you know without an engineering degree, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and just go do. I mean, is that really the value proposition when you're talking to some of your various customers or, or even folks that you currently work with? Yeah, we we try to do things fast, and we have some cool technology, and we really try to develop relationships with these customers. We're not perfect, so we'll, we'll mess things up from time to time, but we really try to own it and step up and fix it and be honest about it. And I'm on the phone with, with all these customers, especially if things do get kind of sideways. So that, that's what we bring. And we've made 50,000 hand pieces over the years. There's little things you figure out in terms of what some people might call secret sauce. So these things don't leak or, you know, short circuit and autoclaves and things like that. So we bring a lot of that to the table. Um, and, and, you know, once people try us, they seem to like us, like I said, they come back for more products. And, and so, um, we think we're doing a pretty good job for people out there. Very good. All right. So can you, can you get into the economics of, of the, of the business model a little bit, you know, let's say bringing on a, a, a client to develop either one of the shavers or, or, or some sort of medical device. Can you explain, you know, the initial contract for the design? And then once you have the manufacturing rights, what, what does that look like as well? Well, often we'll have something called a development and supply agreement, and that'll kind of lay out the terms for both. And in the development agreement, typically there's concerns on both sides about IP and who owns what and who brings what to the table and who keeps you know, what after it's developed. And, you know, payment schedule for different milestones and, you know, product spec, you know, we're going to pay you, we want this to do that. 
Then there's the supply portion that will, you know, say here's obviously the, the pricing and part numbers and things like that. And any other terms like you know, the length of the contract, or if there's, you know, price reductions or price escalation clauses, just the commercial stuff. And, and it's always kind of nice. You can combine it on the one agreement and everyone just kind of moves on. You know, some companies prefer to have the engineering agreement and then their, their procurement group will work on the supply agreement. We're, we're flexible. We'll do it any way that, that people want. Um, the work is the same and, and the, the payout's the same and, and whatever works for their system to make it easier for them to, to set up shop with us, we're happy to work with them. How sticky is that customer base? I mean, they, once, once, they, once they get into agreement with you, especially once they start, manu- if they're manufacturing with you, I mean, the, what, how difficult is it for them to move from using you guys as their primary manufacturers to somebody else? It depends on the product. On our screwdriver line, for example, with that proprietary technology, they, they can't move it unless we were somehow to agree to license that technology, in which case they have to pay us a lot of money. Um, the contract manufacturing stuff, you know, obviously they're a little more flexible in terms of moving that work around. So we just try to service the heck out of people like that and do a good job and, and make it not worth their while to think about any investment in, in second sourcing us or, or worse. <laughs> yeah. Got it. What, what, so what is the competitive, so what does the competitive landscape look like? I mean, are there other products out there that employ a similar model or is the competition more on, on, on the customer side? Great question. Largely it's on the customer side. Um, you know, the, the, the make versus buy decision, or do they really want to have a, a powered screwdriver? Sometimes they like the manual one. Um, there's engineering departments that that have kind of pride of authorship and they don't want to outsource the design to someone called Prodex out there in California. I can do this, we can do this. So so there's that. And there are other companies that do contract manufacturing. I, what, what we have that I, I think a lot of them don't have is, is the pretty complete infrastructure from engineering, QA, regulatory. Um, you know, we, we could take it from the napkin sketch through production. Like I said earlier, we can help with FDA submittals and, and, and everything in between. So and between that and, and some of these technologies I keep talking about, I, I think that helps us compete and have an advantage with some of the other, you know, s- smaller CM types out there. So, I mean, look, the company, you know, as, as exists today, we're, we're recording this on, on March 9th. Uh, 2022 Wednesday, you know, companies around that 50 million market cap range. I mean, is that is that one of the things that when you're talking to a potential customer that maybe is looking to, you know, maybe they just got FDA approval, they, you're working through the designs, they're really looking to manufacture, you know, at a large scale. I mean, is that one of the things they consider like, all right, the, this is a smaller company. I don't know. Like, is is that one of the things they think about? Like, like what what's what's the biggest hurdle sometimes? in customer acquisition? It, that used to be an issue when we were even a bit smaller and frankly, coming <laughs> off some rough years. Like, hey, uh, when I took over was seven-ish years ago, uh, products, you guys are gonna be around because at the time, you know, we weren't making money and uh, why would why would I invest my project with you? And I'm not, not, not sure what, what's gonna happen. So it, it was a kind of a, a gradual process kind of get things on track and, and develop the confidence of a couple of customers and 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 then you know the good thing is like I said we have 20 plus years of history before that big dip of, of uh, we have a reputation I think for a quality product out there they last they're pretty robust so we can we can hang our hat on that and we do because we're small and don't have layers and lots of salespeople in the field we do it the highest levels here get involved with key customers, whether it's in negotiations or, or meetings or visits. And um, we're all very hands-on in the management team, myself included. I, I like our customers. We're really lucky to have some pretty cool customers. And um, so we, we, we all get involved with that. And, and that's how you kind of work through issues like that. We're very open, very transparent. Hopefully that's coming across today. Um, so people like that. They like to know what you really think and what you're really doing for them. And if it's going great, you tell them if you've got a problem, you're honest about it. They, they develop some respect for that and a little, you get a little more credibility. And so that's how we've dealt with that over the years. And, and we've, we've gotten bigger and some momentum and people are noticing and, and that's not such the issue anymore. 
I don't know. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Listen, it's hard, right? I mean, look, it, we, we run a micro cap show here. I mean, most, yeah. most, most companies run into that, right? Where, you know, you, you have some that you want to get the bigger customers, but some, you know, you always have to answer that, that annoying question when you know, internally you can handle it, but they're like, oh, market cap, I don't know. You know like yeah. It's yeah. 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 I guess that's, that's their job. I guess that's their role. So our job is to make them feel good about it. So, right. and it's fair, but it's a fair, it's a fair thing, you know, but, but at the same time, you know, you're like, ah, we can do it. We know we can like, come on, yeah, just give us a chance. We'll show you. And that's why it's, I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that uh, for these three large customers, we're on our, you know, second or third or fourth project with them. That, that means we did prove ourselves to them. And, and so we feel good about that. Very cool. Uh, so it, the market itself, you know, uh, and talking with a few um, folks that I know or, or know the company quite intimately, um, you know, the company is focused or primarily focused in the orthopedic markets. You know, can you tell us the the total addressable market size um, that you're looking to really serve here? Yeah, I mean, that we, we do a different little slivers, arthroscopic, cranial, I mean, they're all hundreds of millions of dollars. Our, our slivers are so small. If they get a little bigger, it's huge incrementally for us. So there, there's plenty of runway out there for us. Um, you know, in, in the CMF market, the cranial drivers, I think we have a pretty good piece of that in terms of power. Uh, we'd, we'd like to get a, a big sliver of the thoracic as well, and then maybe some other parts of the body next. So, yeah. Very good. What do investors get most confused about products? You know, I think it's the, the contract manufacturing versus technology company issue, because for years we were primarily contract manufacturing and, and maybe people were slow to come around to the fact that, hey, they've got some technology, they got their own products, um, they're starting to look and feel a little bit different. Um, that's, that's probably it. Um, you know, the, a lot of them call in and talk to me, so they, they ask questions and and uh, hopefully we clear up a lot of that, that type of confusion. But I think that'd be primarily the one that, that if I were to really want to blanket the world and say, know this about Prodex, it's that we're not just contract manufacturing anymore. Well, uh, what are, when, when they do get confused, I say, what, I'm trying to wrap my head around Prodex. Okay, you have the, the CM side, you have the technology side. It sounds like most of the questions are on the technology side. So maybe we can clear up some of those frequently asked questions right here. So what is that number one question when folks are like, wait, tell me more about the technology side? Um, uh, you know, they, they really try to gauge um, the size of the opportunity and, and the market for that technology and that type of product. And I typically give them kind of an evasive answer, like I gave you a couple minutes ago, you know, without pinning us down to anything. So they like to know just um, how far we can go with that, I think. Um, and, and and they like to understand, hey, you know, no one else can do that. No, not this. So that that comes up a lot um, in, in terms of the calls and, and differentiating between the two. Um, and we've been doing this about seven years and, and, and we've had a lot of really, nice and loyal and, and engaged shareholders. So we've had enough conversations that I think a lot of that is kind of cleared up for them. But, but the newer shareholders or investors, you know, probably got to go through the same process and, and they'll get to know us, I think, I hope. So. Gotcha. Well, well, tell us a little bit on the, on the technology side. You mentioned that, you know, uh, the, you sometimes partner in certain IP, you own your own IP. Can you describe, describe that a little bit and, and help us understand, you know, how you how that is then turning into, you know, different types of revenue models and development deals and all that, all that. Yeah. Uh, so typically in a, in a, in a contract, we'll have clauses and everyone does, I, I suppose. And we bring certain IP to the table. You bring certain IP to the table after we're done this resulting IP, you know, who owns it? And if it's someone's paying us a lot of money to develop a product, then they're going to own the resulting technology. And, and if not, if, if it's a product product and it's maybe just a distribution agreement, then, then we're going to keep ownership of the key technology. We'll license it to them so they can, can ship their, their product. So that's that's fairly common in 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 our in our dealings in our in our con in our contracts. You know, we have a very obvious technology and these screwdrivers, but we also have some more subtle technologies and in, in all the hand pieces we make. Like I said, we made 50,000 of these things. So there's what I call the, the secret sauce. So these, these hand pieces, 
they have to survive a pretty harsh environment in the operating room. They, after a surgery, they go into something called an autoclave, which is a lot of heat and steam and pressure just to sterilize them, then a dishwasher. And so they need to seal because there's motors and electronics that you don't want to short circuit. And it's harder than it sounds to seal that because remember you have a shaft coming out that's rotating. So you, actually there's like, you think a leak point there. So there's all sorts of ways to design and coat the metal and do this and seals and that through years and years of trying this thing, uh, we, we think we've got it figured out pretty well. And that's one of the reasons our, our products last so long in the field. So that's something, you know, we'll bring to the table every, everything we do and, and part of our, our calling card, I guess, if you will, because, because <laughs> of that reputation for stuff that lasts, but, um, but, you know, it, sometimes people come up and say, we want to, a product that does this and here's, you know, our technology. And, and then we'll say, great, we'll match ours to yours. Here's your product. It's your technology. We'd love to manufacture it for you. And it, it goes, we're, like I said, we're very flexible. We, we, we want to, every, every deal we make with a customer, we, we want it to, to be the first of many. We want them to be happy, not just with the product, but with the terms and the agreement and just working with us. So we, we try to give them what they want in a way that they want it and that they'll want to come back and do it again. Very good. Another question I had, and, and, um, and, and I, and I it, it, it has to do with one of the potential risk factors for the company and in, in doing my due diligence. And as you talked about earlier, when it's, it's a smaller customer base, right. It's there, it's yeah. very concentrated, you know, can, can you explain to us, you know, one, why is there so much customer concentration and why this is more indicative of the market versus just, you know, Listen, we'd have we'd go to more, but this is yes. what we got. It's it's a great and important question, one that we've faced for a long time. The the history of the company is relying on one or two major customers, and the down period I referred to earlier came after one of those customers brought some work in house. Not so much anything we did; it's just kind of a strategy thing for them. But so we've always been conscious of that. So the. We have a heavily concentrated customer base. We got three or four big customers, one in particular, very big part of what we do. And so the 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 good news and good news is while we've been making efforts to add additional customers and add additional business, we have. We've we've grown the non-customer one business a lot. That's the good news. The other good news is their business has taken off. So, so while everyone else is growing, so are they. So that percentage remains big. So, I mean, we'd be unhappy with, with a growing top line and, and a great customer and some other good customers. And we're just, we're trying to develop more and more good customers or, or like I was saying earlier, do more work with these other customers when we kind of leverage that relationship and work our way down the hallway and, and do more work. So it's kind of, I don't want to say it's a good problem to have. It's not a, not a problem when your customer is, is growing their business, but it does keep that percentage of customer number one very high, even though the other parts of the business are growing, because we, we really have, in particular since I got in this role, been conscious of that and, and trying to focus on, on diversifying the customer base. Very good. So, uh, what 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 is the thesis? If realized, these are the inflection points that will lead to growth in shareholder value. Well, it's, it, you know, a couple of things come to mind. One is is growing the top line in a profitable manner, and two, uh, I would say that customer concentration um, mix. I think I think we, we've had a really good run. We expect to have a good run. Um, but I think there's always going to be an underlying nervousness when people see that. So, so when that percentage gets smaller, I think that's a good measuring stick or inflection point to, to say, look, we're, we really are a good bet here. I, I think we are anyway. But for the people that might be kind of, hmm, let, let me wait and see. I think that might push a few people over, over, the, over the line and join the team. <laughs> 
Yeah, from from an investing side, I mean, there's it's such a classic microcap from a discoverability side of things. Like, uh, I mean, who's you know, unless you're an engineer or you know, somehow following maybe an orthopedics company or maybe even some of your larger customers, you know, if folks are able to to figure it out, you know, it, it's it's hard, right? I mean, it's it's yeah. it's yeah. classic. You're that classic nuts and bolts, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask a few. Um, you know, corporate questions. You are the CEO, so I, I, want, I wanted to ask. You know, on a, from a capital allocation side of things, you know, how do you think about that? Um, is how, is the company looking at potential acquisitions? Um, is are there potential acquisitions even to look at? You know, to help potentially grow the business. Um, here, we'll start there, and then maybe we'll yeah. go to some other. Ones. Well, it. it- it doesn't sit around. We, we we have an investment committee, myself and two members of the board. And, and for the most part, we'll invest in, in other company securities. And we've had a pretty good track record with that. Um, we've, we've done other kind of special projects, if you will, with, with, with that committee. Um, you know, someday... Uh, yeah, I, I would I would envision some, some smaller strategic acquisitions. It's not on our plate right now. Um, but we have aggressive growth plans and, and whether it's, you know, bolting on some top line or some capabilities to help us grow the, the business, those are definitely possibilities in the future. We're just not actively pursuing right now. We got a lot going on here right now in terms of growing this thing and we are commissioning a new building and, and, and just not maybe the right time for that. But someday, I think that's definitely a possibility. Very good. So, so really, it's all about. I mean, right now, you know, because you have two, you have two manufacturing plants. Am I, am I right there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Got yeah. it. So, so really, it's about right now is you know any kind of free cash flow. It's really redeploying it to to expand capacity. Is that really the thought process? Yeah. For, for the most part, I think that's fair. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I, and how much, if at all, have your shareholders influenced your your decision making process? Yeah, you know, indirectly. So we serve three groups, right? Customers, employees, and shareholders. So we're trying to increase shareholder value. So that influences what we do. Uh, you know, just kind of generally speaking, I, I, I do know that we try to communicate a, a lot and effectively with shareholders. We, I think, do very descriptive and well-written um, 10Qs and 10Ks. We have what I think is a pretty fun annual shareholder meeting every year. And a lot of people come and ask a lot of questions. Everyone gets along great. Um, and like I said earlier, a, a lot of shareholders call me um, and I'm happy to talk about products. I think a lot of them call like right after these earnings releases. It's kind of a safe time to talk and stay out of SEC jail and stuff like that. So um, we, we try to, to welcome them and, and talk to them and, and encourage them. And, and yeah, we try to serve their interests along with our customers and the people that work in this building. And this isn't so much on a corporate question, but I mean, look, the last two years have been hard for so many, so many businesses out there. But, you know, were, were there any challenges, COVID-19 challenges that the company had to overcome? You know, we've, we've been fortunate. Uh, the people have been great in terms of protocols and, and looking out for each other and not coming to work if they're sick. Um, you know, we went... 13 months without anybody um, catching COVID here in the building. Then the holidays hit and then, you know, everyone in the world got Omicron, I guess, but uh, um, then we got, we got through that. We, we, we've been fine. It really has not impacted us. I think it's impacted some of our suppliers, obviously, and we're all dealing with, you know, so far we've stayed one step ahead of Posse on the uh, whole supply chain issue, but, but, you know, it's, it's a struggle every day to track down parts so, you know, so far, so good, but it's not over, I would say, in, in terms of dealing with it. Got it. So I also have to ask, you know, what does failure look like? And then likewise, what does success look like for products? Well, I, I'll start with success. Um, success to me would be a, a growing profitable business with, with customers that like us and want to do more work with us and a place where people like to come to work. I think they have an opportunity to develop and grow into whatever they want to do here or, or anywhere else. Um, that would be success. Failure, I don't know. <laughs> don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, 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 
I think, I guess another way to ask it is, you know, what are, we talked about one, one potential downside risk on customer concentration, but I mean, are there any other, um, you know, risk factors or, or downside risk that folks, folks should, should understand at least when they're considering products? Yeah, I would, I would not say long-term. I think like anyone else, and we talk, touched on a minute ago, short-term supply chain pandemic type stuff. But once you work through that, we got all the fundamentals, I think, in place that the long-term is, it looks good. We've got facilities, we've, we've doubled our capacity, we've got some contracts and, and projects in the development hopper, uh, good customer relationships, some good technology, um, working hard on the business development efforts. So we, we are on track to, to do what I told our board we do a couple couple of years ago in terms of a very aggressive growth plans and uh, just kind of continue what we've been doing the last seven years. So I, I, I hate to be Pollyannish, uh, but I really believe that. I, I, I don't, it was kind of a s- s- smart alecky answer, but I don't envision failure for us. It might take a little bit longer if all of a sudden all these boats in the ocean stay out there a lot longer, but um, we'll be fine. I, I, I don't, I don't see a risk of long-term failure. Very good. All right. Well, to close this out here today, I ask this for, you know, every, every CEO that I have come on here. Do you enjoy being a public company CEO? It's not an easy job. It can be a pain in the, you know what, uh, yeah. but, do, but do you enjoy being a public company CEO? Yes, uh, very much. A couple of reasons. One, uh, we, we got like 140 people. We got a great crew of people, but in particular, there's 50 or so that when I started in this role and the company was struggling, they stayed with us and they could have left and gone somewhere else where the companies were not struggling like we were, but they stayed, you know, did extra work, pitched in and hung around while we turned things around. So it's very gratifying that, that they're part of the success now. So that's, that's one reason I really like it. The other thing is, I hate to use a cliche, but the the buck truly stops here. There's not an important decision that doesn't pass through this office. So that might be scary to some people, but I, but I like it. I mean, how many people through their career think, man, if I was in charge, I'd do it this way. Well, I, I got that chance. So how lucky am I? So I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the people. I enjoy being involved with everything. Um, I like it a lot. And, you know, so far we've been doing okay. So. Very good. All right. Well, Rick, I think that's a great place to end it. You know, for, for more information, where can our audience go and find everything they need to know to follow along the Prodex story? Uh, our website, www.prodex.com. It's P-R-O dash D-E-X. Um, you can, our phone number is on there. You can call and, and ask for me. Like I said, I'm happy to talk to people about things we can talk about publicly. Um, so we try to be accessible. Those are probably the best ways to, to find out more about us. Very good. All right. Well, Rick, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Good luck. Stay safe. And I look forward to our next update. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Good time. Thanks. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not provided as financial, legal, or any other advice. The information is not investment advice or an offer to buy or sell any securities or make any investment. The views expressed by guest speakers are their own and any reference to third-party products, services, or information does not constitute an endorsement thereof by SNN or its affiliates. SNN expressly disclaims all liability for any individual's use of the information presented in this podcast.